right, thank you so much, Tommy. We appreciate your your ministry and uh, your music, your abilities. Thank you for sharing what God has blessed you with with the rest of us uh, very much. Good morning. It's, uh, it's great to see you. This is Pentecost Sunday, and so the day that we celebrate a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit uh, descending upon the disciples in Jerusalem. And I can't, uh, this has become one of my favorite uh, holy days uh, of the year. I mean, I, I remember some time ago, I woke up in Jerusalem one day and realized, I hadn't thought about it until that moment, but had realized it was Pentecost. And I was in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday, uh, walked into uh, St. George's Episcopal Church, Anglican Church, uh, just a couple blocks from the old city walls, and the, the pastor there invited me to, to read the, the Pentecost passages of, of the Holy Spirit. And then, a little bit later that afternoon, we walked over to the Temple Mount, where it's believed that Acts chapter 2 uh, most likely took place where the uh, spirit descended and people began to speak in foreign languages and it was uh, just exciting that to, to be at ground zero with that so so Pentecost to me is is really one of the high holy days in the life of the church uh, because without the Holy Spirit part of our lives and moving in our lives um, oh, we're just in a heap of trouble and so today is a special day uh, because it's also a service of prayer and communion. And what that means is, is there's not going to be a long, bloated, windy message. Okay, we are going. We're, we're going to. We're going to. You can clap. Go ahead. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Just know the Holy Spirit's looking after you, though. All right. Um, and so what we're going to do today is, I really want us to. To focus on prayer. I'll have a few words to say. I'll have some scripture to share with you, but then we're going to take some time and, and use that scripture and and pray. And uh, you'll understand why again a, a little bit later as we get ready to get started in that. But there'll be, you know, we're going to wear out these prayer cushions this summer. Um, do want to let you know that Wednesday, June 8th, that's this Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m., we have the Arkansas Annual Youth Choir who's going to come and bless us with a uh, presentation of song. Um, I would love to see as many people here as possible. Uh, you would be blessed by this. Uh, you will enjoy them. You'll get an opportunity to see what, what our uh, Arkansas United Methodist youth are able to do. And so please make an effort to be here at 6.30. And my guess is it'll be about an hour. Uh, we're also hosting them. Um, I think they're staying. Are they staying overnight in the uh, CLC? Um, and we've got some food coming in for them. And so we just, I, I would love it if we could extend to them some of this incredible hospitality uh, that our church is known for. So if you can help out with that, be part of that, we would love that. Also, please note if you haven't already done so, June 16th at 5.30 p.m., Bishop Muller will be here. He and our district superintendent, uh, Reverend Edna Morgan, are going to be here for our first congregational meeting of several uh, that are intended to help us as a congregation uh, discern what we want to do going forward with everything else that's going on in the life of the United Methodist Church. This is a very important meeting that will kick things off. He will put it all into perspective. Uh, they'll be sharing with us... Uh, uh, financial costs that might be associated with this and they'll be talking about uh, what can be done what can't be they'll explain I mean it's going to be very informative the bishop wants to help us get where we want to be whatever that decision is so it's, it's it's very important to be here we have been informed that we cannot live stream it all right, we cannot put it out on live stream. We cannot record it. So if you want to know what's going on, uh, you want to hear what the bishop has to say, we need you to be here. Okay? If that changes, I'll let you know. All right? So the bishop, June 16th at 530. also want to let you know along those lines, rumor has it in some parts, uh, I think at least over in Clarendon and maybe some other places, that we have disaffiliated. Read my lips. <laughs> we have not disaffiliated. 
okay? We are in process to discern what to do. So if word gets around in our communities, you know the truth, speak the truth in love, let people know we are in process to discern, okay? So I, I invite you to please do that. Um, please, if you haven't already done so during this uh, intro, please uh, let us know that you're here today by uh, signing your presence in the friendship pads that are coming your way. Uh, we'd love to know that you're here. It's part of our membership vows. It's a way we kind of uh, encourage each other and, encur uh, to, and hold each other accountable to be here. Uh, if you don't want to use the friendship pads, you can also text the word HOME to that number on the screen. Likewise, if you're a guest with us today, we'd love to know that you're present. Or if you are uh, uh, not here with us, you can also text uh, to that very same number the word HI, H-I, and we'll know that you were with us as well. Um, if this is your first time with us, we have a special uh, little gift I'd like to get to you just to say thank you for choosing to, to worship the Lord with us on Sunday. Francis Chan said what makes worship amazing is the object of our worship what makes worship amazing is the object of our worship so as we prepare to worship today let's think about who or what we are actually worshiping if God is the object if God is the reason we are here, your worship will be amazing. If it's someone or something else, it won't be. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come to you this day on Pentecost. I ask you to pour yourself out upon us today, whether we want you to or not. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Do in us and through us that which you did in the early disciples in Jerusalem on the south side of the Temple Mount on those teaching steps that day. Come, Holy Spirit, surprise us with your presence as we gather to wait for you to work and to act just like they did. Come, Holy Spirit. Enable us to cast our gaze upon you and our Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And everybody said... Amen. Would you please stand for worship?
week I shared with you how I sense that a lot of United Methodists uh, all around the globe may feel like they've been in the twilight zone. Remember that? Talking about being in this other place, this other dimension, this surreal experience that 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 we hear about, but I just it just it, it can't be happening. That this can't be the new reality, right? I mean, just it, put, it puts people in a uh, in just a strange situation. Little did I realize that when I went to annual conference this week that twilight zone metaphor would carry through. I mean, annual conference was just different this year. This year, I mean, you you, you can talk to David Leach or, or myself about it, but there was just from the very beginning walking in. What I noticed the first first off was th- there wasn't a whole lot of animosity and there wasn't a whole lot of tension. Uh, usually, there's you know something's going to happen and there's going to be you know some sparks that are going to fly in Christian love, of course, um, and. That, that that wasn't there. That was the first thing I noticed. But then secondly, it just seemed like a, there was a sadness, a solemnness, a um, soberness that just everywhere you went, uh, you, you could see it in the way people carried themselves. You could see it in their eyes. I think there was this this this, this sense, this realization that our denomination worldwide and now in the state of Arkansas is in a strange place the twilight zone I think the majority of the people there or I thought the majority of the people there were were grieving in part because they realized that things were going to be different at this annual conference. I got the sense that people were sad because they had made up their mind regarding a particular piece of legislation that was coming forward that was going to allow for another option for an amicable separation for congregations that wanted to leave, regardless of where they fall on the spectrum of theology and social action. action. It, It wouldn't matter. And that didn't happen. Annual conference has left those who participated and those who are getting word after the fact... hasn't really changed anything for us and a lot of churches that are in a discernment process already other than it might give us another bump or two in the road that we've got to deal with no and that's okay but coming out of annual conference I realized just as I had said the Sunday before that Man, if there's ever a time in our lives as individual Christ followers and as, and, and as a congregation, there's ever a time we need to be a church that is prayerful, being prayerful, where each of us are praying in our own homes and in our own places and where we come together as a congregation to pray. The time is, the time is now. It, it, it's this summer. I would love for us to, to think about this summer as a summer of, uh, of prayer, a time for prayer for us all to become prayerful. I mean, the Bible teaches us that prayer is an incredible catalyst that God uses in order to do the work of God. And so what we're going to do, instead of a whole lot of preaching is we want to do a whole lot of praying or what will seem like a whole lot of praying to us. Instead of preaching on prayer or talking about prayer, we're going to put the practice to pray into play today. 
Scripture makes it clear that God tends to act more, react more, to respond more to people when they pray than when they don't. (laughs) And so we want to take advantage of that observation. It seems like in the Scriptures that when individual Christians are faithful in their prayer lives and combine that with the faithfulness of praying as a congregation, as corporately together, that God does some pretty extraordinary and exciting things. Now in the Bible, I'm going to share with you a couple passages here out of Joel. There are a couple situations where things were really kind of rough going for the people of Israel. When things were rough, when they were in crisis, when they were in difficult times, when things weren't, they knew things weren't the way they were supposed to be, uh, they would call a sacred assembly. They would gather as many people as they could from across the nation to come and to pray and to seek God. And so that's what I want us to take a look at today. Is being a sacred assembly. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Join me in praying. Holy Spirit, prepare my heart and mind to absorb your word, to soak it up like a dry sponge soaking up water. Fill me and transform me from the inside out. Amen. In a couple of places, the prophet Joel says, Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. A little bit later, he goes on to say, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. During times of crisis such as what is happening in this particular situation, prayer and fasting were often the first thing that the people of Israel were called to do. In this situation, Israel has been facing a plague, a devastating locust plague. Not metaphorically, but in reality, it was devastating the country. It had brought famine and drought, and the people were in desperate need. They also believed that such a plague was probably the result of God's displeasure and God's unhappiness, that they weren't living the way they should have been living, right? And so in response to that, the prophet Joel calls the sacred assembly to to get as many people from around the nation to come to Jerusalem to seek God's face, to seek God's forgiveness for their sin, to repent of of, sin. of their of what's going on in their life and to realign themselves with God and to seek God's favor and to seek God's mercy. Periodically, churches do that today. They'll have sacred assemblies where they come together for some corporate soul searching, for individual self-examination to see where they're at with their walk with the Lord, to repent, to confess sin, to fast. Honestly, I think the United Methodist Church is in a place where regardless of where individuals fall on the issues that are before us, that we're at a place where a sacred assembly is warranted and called for. And so that's what I want us to do. We're going to get on our knees here shortly and have our own little sacred assembly. And here's what it's going to look like. I've got two scripture passages that I'm going to share with you. Um, I'll read one, have a brief little commentary about it, and then we'll sing a song, and then we'll come to the prayer rail, or you can pray in your pew, and have a time of prayer for that particular emphasis. I'll read the second passage of scripture. Um, and I'll actually be using that one twice because it's got two different hooks where I, I want to hang our hats on, so to speak. So we'll read the scripture, brief comment, sing a song, come and pray. And then we'll do that again. And then I think by the time we've done that, our hearts and our minds will be as such that we'll be ready for Holy Communion. 
and what Christ has done for us there. So having said that, hear these words from the prophet Jeremiah. God said, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Speaking to King Solomon one night, this is the next passage, the Lord told him, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So let's jump back to what I just said in Jeremiah 33. In that particular text, what we learn about is that there's a phrase, the words, great and mighty things. That phrase speaks of things that are beyond our control as human beings, that they are out there beyond our ability to do anything about or to change. The only person that can, can change that, who can meet those needs, do anything about it, is God Almighty, our Heavenly Father. What he's referring to here is basically letting us know we are helpless to do some things in life. There are some things that only God can do. And so he's drawing attention to that. But he goes on to say, God will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. You say, hey, look, there's some things you, don't know, you do not know about yourselves that, that I will inform you about. There are some things you don't know about the situation that I can inform you about. There are just some things that we'll never know enough on our own. We can make the best decisions we think we're going to make, but it's sometimes it's still not quite good enough. We still don't know, but God does. In this short little phrase from Jeremiah, he goes on to say, When you uh, call to me, I will answer you. So what God is saying here, when you call on me, when, when, you, when you come to me, God's promising to do some supernatural work and activity in the life of this nation. So what I want to invite us to do, just for the next few minutes here, is to have a sacred assembly and to call out to God for God to manifest God's presence, to, to ask God to, to show up in your life and give God permission to show up wherever God wants to in your life today to call on God to manifest Himself or to, to show up in the life of our church as a congregation and our denomination and our nation. But it's just simply a time, however you want to phrase it, however the, whatever the words you are you want to put to it, it's to call on God to reveal Himself and His power in these areas. And so we're going to sing this song and then we're going to invite you to pray. You can turn right. You can sit as you pray. You can turn around and kneel and use your 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 pew as a prayer bench, or you can come to the prayer railing and spend a couple of minutes in prayer. And then we'll go on to the next scripture that we're going to share with you. So let us sing.
invite you now to take the time that you want in prayer. Prayer guide is up before you on the screen to call out to God, asking Him to show up in your life, in the life of our church, in the life of our nation, wherever. So you've got a couple minutes. Let's pray together and call out to God. hear these words again from Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. These are words being spoken uh, to King Solomon. The Lord says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. The Hebrew word for turn here is what we often use for return, right? Turn around, return, come back. We're called to return from ways that have crept into our lives, uh, worldly ways, values from the world, secular humanism. I mean, there's uh, impact, uh, negative uh, influences from this world that make it into our lives that, that we allow to influence us from being completely faithful and obedient and loyal to Jesus Christ. It's so easy for the world to to seep in to our lives. Sinful seeping that maybe we don't even realize the impact or the effect But if we're not careful, sometimes the influence of the world influences Christ followers and the body of Christ more than the body of Christ influences the world. If we're not careful, then sometimes what seems to happen is that churches seem to mirror more the values of the world than the other way around. In response to God and His Word in this particular passage, I want to invite us to practice what the biblical or Bible calls repentance. That's just simply asking the Holy Spirit to, to reveal to us maybe where. The world has influenced us more than we realize. Uh, Followed by a decision to realign ourselves with what God's calling us to do. To live faithfully, whatever that might be. It's a time to also confess our sins before the Lord God. And then at the same time to rejoice in words like this. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, here in a moment after we sing, 
going to invite you to pray and ask you to pray, to, to name sins in your life. And if you don't know, <laughs> don't know of any, um, don't ask the person next to you. But you can ask the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Holy Spirit will inform you and let you know of those, of that, of that, the residue of sin in your life, how it's, where it's impacting you and your walk with God or your walk with somebody else that maybe you're not, again, aware of. And then we confess and we rejoice that Jesus Christ forgives us. So a time of confession and a time of repentance. So consider your sins when it's time to pray. Consider the sins of a church, whatever that might be. Sometimes corporate entities have done things or made decisions or, or something in the past that maybe should not have been made. So ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight into that as well as to the sins of a nation and denomination. And then confess them to the Lord. Let's sing together.
time to come before our Emmanuel and to pray, to consider and to confess our sins, the sins of our denomination, the sins of our church, the sins of our nation, and to repent. So let's join together in prayer. final focus of our sacred assembly today deals with surrendering to God. Hear these words again. In fact, I'll tell you what, why don't you read them with me today. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This verse speaks to a response that God expects from his people before he responds to his people. He wants people, and in this situation, nations, the citizens of Israel, he, he wants them to turn back to him. They, they as a nation have, have wandered far from who God is and what God expects of his people and the way he calls them to live. And so in this text, God calls them to surrender themselves through the practice of humility, to humble yourselves and pray. To humble is to surrender oneself to, to another. It's to submit oneself to another. It's, it's to remove the I from all the decisions I make and replace it with the Lord. To humble oneself before the Lord requires a person to make it about the Lord more than about themselves. And that's hard to do. To some degree, what the Lord is asking of the people of Israel here, and I suspect is asking us and all other Christ followers as well, is that we've got to get beyond ourselves. And the selfish sinful desires that often keep us from doing what God wants us to do, from living the way God calls us to live. The need for the hour in this particular passage, and particularly for Israel, the need here was for them to humble themselves in full surrender to God. And to do that wholeheartedly with their whole heart, with their whole being, uh, to, to submit themselves to Him and His will. 
me ask you something. When you think of the topic, uh, the words full surrender, and full surrendering of yourself, of your life to God, does anything come to mind? Is there anything that immediately comes to mind that, that you have not submitted to the Lord God that maybe the Lord's asking you to bring before Him? What about as a church? Or again, as a denomination? Or as a nation? If so, the text tells us to surrender, to humble ourselves. And then God will respond. And this is what's important with this particular passage, because a lot of people will read it and talk about it. Uh, but this is, this is conditional. God is saying, if you will humble yourselves, right? If you will call on me, if you will seek my face, if you will confess your sins, if, 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 then I will. If we pray, if we seek Him, God will hear our prayers, God will forgive our sins, and God will heal people and our nation and other groups. It also means that God won't hear us or is unlikely to hear us or not as willing to hear us. God is not as likely to heal us and our land if people do not pray, if people do not seek God out. And so today we want to humble ourselves, or I'm inviting us to humble ourselves by surrendering more of our lives to God. Maybe just one area today. Maybe there's just one place in our mind or in our heart or some, some decision or activity we, we, we're making that God wants us to say. God's the Spirit's tapping you and saying, I want this. So we're going to sing here in a second and then join together in another sacred assembly, a time of prayer, where we will wrestle with surrendering and submitting ourselves to the Lord. Let's sing.
anything come to mind when it comes to surrendering in your life, the life of the church, the nation? Let's humble ourselves and surrender ourselves to God. Let's be in a spirit of prayer. for Holy Communion. Would you agree? Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and each other. We confess that we... Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved You with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done Your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You would be saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and reply to me. I need forgiveness too. So just say, Fink, you are forgiven. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new spirit covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself, he went and he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, during the supper, Jesus took a cup of wine and after blessing it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, 
blood of the forgiveness of sins, of the new covenant poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving to you in holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Jesus, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now with the confidence... Go ahead. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'm going to ask Addison to come up. And um, she and I are going to serve each other communion. And while we're doing that, I want to invite uh, the communion stewards, those who are going to assist our ushers and others, to also come forward. And Addison and I will serve you. And then after that, our ushers will release you by pews to come and to receive communion as well. We do have gluten-free bread here. And we have some individual uh, self-contained packets of juice and bread as well uh, here if you would like that just a reminder of our communion offering if you want to give to one of our local uh, outreach opportunities we'd love for you to do that
opportunity so blessed many times to see what God is doing in the, the eyes and in the faces of you as you come forward for communion and you know, when you see the, our children being raised in the faith praying at the altar serving us saying the, the, the word it's just uh, <laughs> thank you Jesus thank you, thank you, thank you I want to invite our ushers to come forward at this time we have much to be thankful for do we not? we have much to be grateful for <laughs> do we not? Uh, my gosh um, I, I just encourage us to, to give with a grateful heart for who God is and what God has done in our life and is going to continue to do um, so just show, just show the Lord how much you love Him through your giving. Father God, receive these gifts. It's, just, it's not the only way, Lord, but it is certainly one way that we know speaks very loud to you about where you stand in our life. We love you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> not an amen? I knew there was one in there. I invite you to stand with me at this time as we now affirm our faith in the traditional Christian creed that, that Christians around the world recite on any given day. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. us as we go out into this world that we do so under the power and the guise of the Holy Spirit. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Rest in the Holy Spirit. Call upon the Holy Spirit. 
as you go throughout this week. I want to encourage you, please, let's become more of a prayerful church, more of a prayerful congregation. And I mean prayerful for the summer. The more we pray, the more likely we will find ourselves doing the will of God, being transformed by the, 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 the Spirit of God and being the people of God He calls us to be. And we need that. Our world needs that. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you His most incredible, amazing peace. And God's people said, Have a great week, everybody. Blessings.